All right, uh, it's wonderful to be here. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Zika Coulter, as mentioned, I'm from Carnegie Mellon University. And I'm gonna talk about, as well as the Bosch Center for AI, and I'm gonna talk about incorporating dynamical systems and control structure into neural networks. Uh, this is the work with many of my students, Brandon, Priya, Mel, uh, Philip, and Gaurav. And I'll, I'll mention each of these as I, as I go. So, all right, um, let me jump right in since we are limited in time here. But of course, that can be very fast uh, at this introduction because it just so happens that the examples I'm going to give here are the exact three examples, I think, that was presented uh, earlier. Um, I think I'm showing Dota instead of uh, Alpha Star, but that's essentially the exact same thing. They came out at the exact same time. So Atari, Go, and real-time playing games. And then the, the big reveal, of course, is exactly what I mentioned before. And I swear there was no coordination that was involved here. But the, the question, of course, is that if they're so good at controlling all these amazing games, why don't they fly planes? Uh, and the answer was given before. Uh, so really, literally, this is the, the no, no coordination beforehand. This is just this is coincidences. So of course, uh, yeah. <laughs> Excuse you. it's the universal truth, right? Arrived at, but this is clearly the, <laughs> the right way of thinking about these things. Um, so clearly these two domains, classically speaking, have different perceived advantages and disadvantages, right? Uh, and so you know, control is, this, is the setting of stability, of sort of guarantees of typically though relatively simple policies. I know not all of them uh, really, but like at an instantaneous time stamp step, you have typically a simple linear policy. Whereas in deep learning, there's very expressive policies. They're high performance, but they are brittle and non-robust, right? This is sort of the the standard kind of kind of uh, layout. And I think as, as with many talks today, this talk is gonna be about kind of the bridge, thinking about how we bridge these two worlds. Okay, um, but what I will say from a high level is that I think, I think kind of interestingly enough, even though we start at the exact same kind of starting point here, um, it's actually gonna be a rather different pers high level perspective on possible connections here. Because where I think, um, uh, the previous talk was maybe, I mean, I'm maybe summarizing badly here, let me know if I'm wrong, but sort of bringing control theory tools to bear upon neural networks. Um, this talk is really about how you sort of engineer neural networks to have these policies to begin with. Maybe your last element was a little bit more like that, but um, this talk is going to be essentially about how we build structure into deep networks in a way that can make them inherently a little bit more principled and have the properties that we want these things to have. Okay, so um, here's, here's the outline. These are actually relatively short sections, each of these, and I'll, I'll go through them in order. But what each of these is going to be is it's going to be a little snippet of how we can begin to inject structure into the kinds of neural networks that we build in order to achieve certain goals with respect to dynamical systems or control or stability or any other factors that we want to have. All right, and that's the agenda for the, for the talk today. So to start with, I'm gonna start with the most basic kind of principle, which will really kind of drive most of the rest of the sections in this talk here, which is about building structure into deep networks using a tool I'm going to talk about called the implicit function theorem or really just implicit functions as a tool for doing this period. Okay, um, so let me jump right in. Often when we talk about neural networks, you'll see figures like this, right? So we think of neural networks as basically a combination of you know, linear operators followed by nonlinear oper non operators that you know, you know, sequentially transform your inputs into some output. And so those arrows there correspond basically to matrix multiplications followed by a nonlinear activation function. You repeat this multiple times and you get some output. And that's the, the model we have in mind, I think, for a lot of neural networks. Now, of course, they might be a little bit more complicated. Maybe those linear operators are convolutions. Maybe a few of these are, uh, nowadays, they're, they're self-attention operators, which are a little bit more complicated since they have, uh, element-wise products, but they're, they're basically the same kind of thing, right? Matrix multiplies and nonlinear operators. But what I want to argue today and, and sort of uh, advocate for is that this is a very incomplete notion of a neural network, right? Because neural networks, what they fundamentally are, or at least the way I think of neural networks, is they are composable differentiable functions, 
right? That's what they really are. This is how we train them. This is how we build them in leverage like PyTorch or anything else. They're just differentiable functions that we hook together to transform inputs to outputs. That's what a, a neural network is. It, it's at this point, a, a horrible misnomer because there's nothing really neural about it anymore, but it's, this is what we mean these days when we say neural networks. And because of this, we can really plug anything we want there as a layer in our neural networks. And in particular, um, I'm going to give some examples today, but there's many more examples out there. You can plug in things like optimizers, not like the outer loop optimizers like gradient ascent that does this. You can plug in a quadratic programming solver as a layer in your network if you want to. You can plug a robust control specification as a layer in your neural network. I'll talk about those two in a, in a moment, actually. Um, you can plug a physics engine as a layer in your network. Um, and, and in fact, we have done this and it's been quite valuable for <laughs> publications. <laughs> um, but the key idea is there's a unifying theme to all of this. And the unifying theme is that all of these things, right, for the most part, all these sort of complicated functions that we might want to implement in our system, they can more or less be defined in terms of root finding methods, right? Uh, solving some equation, right? So if I want to solve an optimization problem, I find the zero of some nonlinear equation that expresses the KKT conditions of that optimization problem. If I want to solve a physics engine, I write my Newtonian mechanics as a set of uh, a linear complementarity problem that has to be solved, right? Um, many of these things, not all of them, but, but many of them, uh, and many very complex tasks, I should mention, uh, can be formulated in this way, right? Basically finding, uh, if, if your inputs that layer are X and your outputs are Y, then we don't think of the output Y as just some sort of fixed computational function, simple function of the input. Rather, Y, the output of that layer, is, a, is, is the solution to some nonlinear equation that satisfies some conditions. And so what we call an implicit form layer in deep networks. And the point that I wanna make here, the only point that I wanna make in this section really is that this is allowable in deep networks. Nothing that prevents us from doing this. We think of layers as sort of simple uh, units of compute, but they don't have to be. A layer can be a very complicated thing. It can be a whole optimization solver that we run to find the output of that layer. And the thing that's required though, to make it a layer is that we have to be able to first compute it. I mean, that's, that's necessary too, but you also have to be able to differentiate through it, right? The, the whole principle of deep networks is that you train networks by back propagation. This means that you compute gradients or Jacobians, or really you left multiply by Jacobians um, within your network. Okay. So this is all doable though, you know, we can have whatever we want as a layer as long as we can form or really multiply by our Jacobians. And the only point I want to make here is that this is actually very easy to do for such implicit layers. Because using, you know, very basic properties, let's go back hundreds of years now, right? The implicit function theorem of calculus. We can say that if we have some fixed point which characterizes the solution in this equation, then we can differentiate this thing, assuming that we're at a, a point of non-singularity, we can differentiate this thing and apply the chain rule and manipulate things a bit to get the equation we want, which is the derivative of our output with respect to any input we have as a function of some Jacobian term here times, I would call, call these like normal derivatives, right? These, 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 these things on the right here are derivatives that can be computed using kind of tools like PyTorch or TensorFlow. And these ideas go back sort of many centuries, <laughs> I guess, to, uh, to Cauchy, right? He, I think he was <laughs> the first, the first instantiation of the multivariate uh, implicit function theorem. So um, this is what we're going to do. And actually, I mean, this is a very high level thing. I'm gonna give some concrete examples of this in a second because this is very abstract right now. But at a high level, what I'm gonna advocate for is that we can directly embed very structured complex operations into deep networks and back propagate through these complex operations using implicit differentiation. And the key point here that I want to, if, if some people are familiar with this, it's might be getting a little bit detailed now, but the key point that I wanna make <clears throat> is that this can be done exactly. 
So one very common trend kind of in deep learning before actually we started kind of doing a lot of this implicit work is that it was very common to take kind of normal procedures and unroll them in your computational graph. So right, if you, if you have a solver, any kind of solver, you can just kind of implement that solver in PyTorch and then differentiate through that, right? Because that's, that's a valid compute graph. You can differentiate through it. But this is a very bad idea because when you do that, you store every intermediate iterate of your iterative method. You store that in memory in your compute graph, and that's a very bad thing. And so what I'm going to actually advocate for in the remainder of this talk is instead doing what I kind of showed on before, which is to find exact solutions to your problem using uh, whatever solver you want, and then differentiate analytically using implicit differentiation to compute backprop. And I'll give a few examples of what you can do with this in the rest of the talk. But this is the key, I guess, principle that really enables everything else we're doing. Um, if you want some more information on this, this is a very quick overview. Actually, a few years ago, uh, David Duvenal, who's one of the inventors of the neural ODE, Matt Johnson, who's the developer of the JAX framework, now rivals TensorFlow and PyTorch these days, uh, and I gave a tutorial on implicit uh, layers in deep networks that goes over these ideas in, 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 as well as some of the ones I'll talk about later in quite a bit of detail. Okay, so now let me get some examples of sort of what you can do with this. And, and actually, we're, we're not going to have too much math here, at least not too much uh, kind of math. You have to grok because we're going to sort of jump from one thing to another here. But I'm going to give now several examples of sort of this principle in action, seeing what we can do when we're able to build structured layers in deep networks and differentiate through. The first thing I want to talk about is um, convex optimization as a layer. Right? And this is actually going to be a little bit generic, then I'll talk about an application uh, next in robust control. So <clears throat> one of the obvious things that we could choose, well, maybe not that obvious, but one of the <laughs> But the first things that we thought to choose for these structured layers was to actually make a layer itself that would solve an optimization problem. What I mean by this is that um, the output of this layer, uh, y, would be some function of, um, uh, the output would be a, the solution to an optimization problem, essentially where the optimization objective and the constraint set were somehow governed by the input to that layer. So y, the output here would be some minimization problem over, um, over z, where the z has to be in some constraints dictated by x, and the, the objective also is defined somehow jointly in x and z. And in general, and I'll, I'll give, again, I'll give some examples of this in a second, <laughs> but generally speaking, um, we can express a very generic class of optimization problems in this form using cone programs, right? So uh, obviously, I think most people here know that uh, you can express a, a, a huge swath of optimization problems using essentially linear programs where the linear uh, there with uh, linear objectives and then linear inequality or linear constraints where the constraints has to lie in some cone. Okay. So semi-definite programming, second order cone programming, these all fall into this class of problems here. All right, so <clears throat> essentially solving that optimization problem this is the, the one line word because the one line description here, because uh, going the details are a bit more complex, but um, this is the, you know, they are in the papers if you want to look at the details here. Um, the one line description is that finding an optimal solution to that optimization problem is just equivalent to finding a zero of the KKT conditions associated with that problem. And that, process can be expressed as finding the zero of some nonlinear equation. And because it is of this form, we can apply the same ideas from this implicit differentiation to both first solve the problem. I mean, I mean to solve it, we just use existing solvers. Um, but then to backprop through it, we use the ideas from the previous slide slides to perform gradient descent uh, on our network overall. So it's important to understand here that that the optimum I'm talking about here is optimization that happens in line in a single pass to the network, right? So you learn the parameters of this network 
uh, at an outer le level optimization. It's essentially sort of like a bi-level bi optimization problem. But the inner optimization problem here is one where you solve it analytically in every forward pass of the network, and then you differentiate through it in every backward pass of the network. I'll give some examples in a second, but um, that's, the, that's the basic idea. Now, before I talk about some applications, I want to talk about a little bit more practical aspects of this, which is that in practice, um, it's very hard to know what to do with kind of, kind of abstract kind of cone programs. They're, they're quite hard to deal with. Um, I don't like translating my you know, convex programs into cone programs. I did it when I was learning these things first. I never want to do it again, right? I think we all sort of agree with this. Um, what I actually want to do is write it in a language uh, like CVXPy is my current favorite or CVX for those still you know, in the dark ages of MATLAB here, or there's many alternatives for other languages as well these days. Julia has some nice ones too. Right. Um, so if, if I were to want to solve a problem like this convex problem on the left here, I would write it in a language like um, CVXPy, which is a tool out of Stephen Boyd's group in uh, at Stanford. And actually, this, was the, this, this work as a whole was also done, some of it in collaboration with them. Um, and this would let you very easily solve this sort of convex problem, right, for very generic forms, not for all forms of convex problems, but for very generic forms of convex problems. And so one of the things we did in this work, so, it, so actually this, this paper, this, this section of the whole here, I should mention sort of has Paul's two lines of work here. The first was some work of uh, Brandon Amos, a student of mine, um, kind of on the possibility of differential optimization. And a later one also with Brandon, but also with Stephen Boyd and, and his students um, was one on kind of making this practical. And on the practical side, what we did is we created a differentiable version of CVXPy. So CVXPy, again, is, is a tool they've used, basically a prototyping language for specifying the, uh, convex optimization problems in Python. And we created a pipeline that uh, transforms CVXPy problems into cone programs, but does it in a fully differentiable manner, and then differentiates through a general purpose cone solver so as to make the, and so as to make the entire process uh, differentiable. And what this means in the end, uh, I won't go through it too much, is that if you use a library like PyTorch or TensorFlow or JAX, you can take a CVXPy problem and call this CVXPy layer construct there, which is, a, which, which is our library there, to convert this convex problem into a layer that you can plug in as just anything you want in your in your deep network, right? So you know you have a, a convolutional layer, and now you that can feed into a CVX Pi layer, uh, and you can solve this. And it won't be the fastest thing, by the way, of course, right? You're 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 sort of serializing um, these convex problems and 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 solving it in a you know not GPU very efficient manner and things like this. But it will work quite robustly, and it's a great way to sort of prototype these solvers until you're ready to you know be sure this is your one problem you want to solve. And then maybe you implement a custom solver that can solve it a bit more quickly. Okay, so that's the tool. But before, but but now, um, and this is a sort of very very general tool here. But now I want to give some notion of um, how we can use this and what kind of things we can do with this once we have the ability to form these differentiable complex optimization problems and incorporate them in networks. And here, finally, I'm going to now start getting to some uh, control uh, for, the, for, this, for this audience. I know it's a long time coming here. Um, but I'm going to use it to define neural, a class of neural networks that satisfy certain robust control specifications. OK? Because as, as sort of was said at the very beginning, right? you probably wouldn't trust the plane to fly um, based upon sort of a neural network control law. You know, a deep learn, you know, deep RL agent. You probably wouldn't want to fly a plane. You'd want to have some sort of stability guarantees, at least for the parts that we understand well. Um, and maybe within those sort of range of stable controllers, you maybe want to use a little bit of deep RL or a more expressive policy class to fine tune to get the best performance you can, while still obeying the overall constraints of of uh, of robust control. So the setting I'm going to consider here is one of um, norm-bounded LDIs, linear, linear dynamical inclusion. So the idea here is your state evolves according to some linear system plus a disturbance term. 
So that disturbance term can be arbitrary. It can even be state dependent too. So it's an arbitrary disturbance term. The only condition of this of the disturbance term is that it's bounded as a function of the state and the control you apply. And this is, by the way, a very restricted setting, I know. Um, but it is one such, I'm mainly using it as an illustrative example of a class of um, sort of, uh, yeah, a, a class of systems for which we can, we know how to derive robust control laws. And we're going to apply a similar thing to derive neural networks that are guaranteed to, to obey similar constraints. Okay, so now let me talk about sort of the classical way of synthesizing controllers for systems like this. So what you would typically do if you, if you have, so this is assuming also you know A, B, G, C, and D, right? So you see, you know the bounds, you might not know the actual system itself, but you know the bounds that govern the system um, as is typically done in robust control, right? But if you know all these things, what you would do is you would basically solve a great big, <laughs> you wanna find a linear control law that can control the system stably. And the way you do that is you solve a great big linear matrix inequality, um, that, you know, and then you, and then you set your controller by this equation here. So I sort of always joke about this and say, so clearly, you know, <laughs> obviously you should do this, right? Um, but what's really happening here? I mean, this this course looks very looks very confusing. Um, if you're not used to seeing these things all of the, all all the time, maybe the audience here, maybe this is really second nature to everyone here. Um, but what's happening here, of course, is very simple. What you're doing is you're defining a quadratic Lyapunov function, and then you are defining an LMI. Uh, using the uh, yes procedure or whatever other tools you want that guarantees that that Lyapunov function is negative definite um, while of course also being, oh, sorry, the, the, the derivatives are negative while the overall Lyapunov function is positive definite. The derivatives are negative whenever the bounds of the, of the system are, are satisfied. So whenever these bounds here are satisfied, the, 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 the system is decreasing for a positive definite um, Lyapunov function. Okay, and, and that's the basic idea, is that just we're defining some positive definite function that's decreasing uh, along trajectories when the bounds of the system are satisfied. However, the control law you get out here will still be a linear control law, right? Which is still gonna be therefore a conservative control law that you may be able to improve upon if you were to use a neural network control. And by the way, I, I know there are also adaptive control techniques you can use for these same things. Um, this, this is more a proof of concept than anything else. Um, but what I want to illustrate here is the fact that we can actually use kind of classical deep reinforcement learning to learn controllers that have the same guarantees as this robust control law. So how do we do that? Well, the idea is actually very simple. The idea is we're going to take the output of a neural network, some neural network controller, so an arbitrary function of the state to some arbitrary control, and we're going to project it into the space of functions that satisfy the sufficient decrease condition given by the Lyapunov function. Because, I mean, those, that control law you saw before would actually, actually produce two things when you solve that big equation here, right? It produces both a controller, but it also produces a Lyapunov function itself. It's actually just the Lyapunov function that's the quadratic on S inverse there. Actually, maybe S. I forget which one it is. <laughs> um, okay, and once you have this function, it turns out you can now look and say, hey, look, you know, the, the worst case decrease of my, basically, or, you know, the, the largest decrease, essentially, that, that I could get of my Lyapunov function, if I optimize over that for a given Lyapunov function, ends up being some convex function of my state u. And so the set for which this thing is less than zero is a set of sort of all stabilizing actions of my controller. Okay. This ends up being a convex set in U. And that means, and again, this is sort of the high level pitch here. Um, if you didn't follow that, that's certainly fine. Um, I can formulate the set of all allowable control laws, period, that sort of decrease this Lyapunov function as the set of all points that where, where, where this sort of thing on the, on the right here is negative. And what this means is, if I want to form a provably robust policy, provably robust controller, I can take any control law, or I can take any controller I want, like a just arbitrary connected neural network, I can do whatever kind of network I want, 
And then I can just project it onto the set of all controls u such that u is this, this condition here is less than zero. Now this seems, this is a non-trivial projection, of course. Um, well, it's not that, that hard, it's a second order Cohen program. But from what we've just seen, that problem winds up being one that can easily express as a convex optimization problem. Okay, so this projection itself is a convex problem. And so, because we can differentiate through it now using the techniques I just showed you, we are actually able to guarantee that the composition of this projection and the original policy here is a safe policy, but one which can potentially benefit from the nonlinear elements of this function f here. All right, so let me summarize that because there's, there's a lot sort of going on there. So let me, let me kind of give a high level summary of what I just went through here. So the high level is, here's how you would apply this approach. You're given some robust control specification you want to you want to solve, right? You know, here's my here here here's a uh, LDI representation of my dynamical system. I'm going to first synthesize a robust control law and robust Lyapunov function using kind of classical, and I'll just call it classical or not, but <laughs> uh, what I would think of as classical techniques in in robust control. We then use the outputs of that robust control synthesis to define a set of safe actions that we can take, i.e. actions that they're guaranteed to decrease the Lyapunov function given that robust control specification. And then we define our final kind of deep network or neural network function as an arbitrary neural network concatenated with a differentiable convex optimization problem that projects that policy into our safe set. And that becomes our new policy class. And if we optimize over that policy class, we have, can have some of the benefits of deep networks while simultaneously still obeying the constraints of robust control. How much time was left? Two minutes, okay, perfect. So, um, as you sort of see here, I should have more than that because I started later, right? I started quite a bit. I started like 10 minutes after time. That's, that's, a, that's a bit much. Um, <laughs> suspicious. Um, <laughs> all right, so what we have when we sort of evaluate things is we have a set of, of, uh, of non-robust methods like LQR, MVP, and, and, and PPO. MVP is model-based model, model policy optimization. PPO is a standard kind of RL method. Um, we have kind of a robust version of LQR, where you solve the LQ LQR objective, but you have these constraints of, of robustness. And what we find here is that, um, uh, and, and our method is the last two here. What we find here is that our methods, the, the key points to take away here is that our methods, and this is for some uh, LDI system that we sort of work with, but details are in the paper. But the idea being that the uh, robust methods achieve um, under the nominal system, the robust methods that we have achieve better performance than under the LQR cost. Than the LQR method because they're able to exploit non-linearity non non to do better. Um, but then under adversarial perturbations, right, sort of worst case perturbations chosen to try to fool the system under the allowable specification, um, they still remain stable. Whereas all the nominal sort of non-robust methods do quite a bit worse. Okay. Um, in the interest of getting back on time a little bit, I should have more than two minutes left. But. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll try to get back a little bit. I'll, sk I'll skip the next bit. The, the only thing I'll say on the next bit is you can do the same thing, not just, with, not just with optimizers, but also with things like physics engines. So physics engines also are a nonlinear set of equations that usually are made to satisfy, say, a, a, a linear complementarity problem that, that dictate the equations of motion for rigid bodies. Um, same is true, by the way, also for, uh, it doesn't have to be Newtonian physics, though. It can also be things like fluid dynamics. Um, PDEs also uh, can differentiate it through. That's just what the adjoint method, in fact, is. It's just differentiating through a, PG, a, a PDE. Um, and what I'll say here is that if you, if you do things like this, um, you are able to do things like use model-based control to solve RL tasks. Right? So think about a game like Breakout. Um, Breakout, I would argue, is, is actually a physics game. Right? It's not almost often framed that way. Breakout's physics. So, you, know, you have this little paddle at the bottom. You hit the ball up to bounce around. Um, we know that 
RL can solve this problem, but it solves it by using a huge number of samples from the actual domain. And if instead we build a physics engine into our solver and then enforce our sort of policy to be kind of a, an iterative LQR-like method after, you know, based upon this physics engine, uh, where of course some things still need to be learned like the, like the sys ID for that physics engine, um, we do much better in turn, or actually we do a little, sorry, we do a little bit worse in terms of sort of final performance than Q learning, but we can learn with about a thousand examples instead of the normal 10 million examples for traditional Q learning, right? Okay. Maybe, okay, again, I'll go to the, the, the next one briefly as well. So as we get back on time. Um, but let me now also talk about um, one last thing, which is about um, a slightly different variant of this on learning systems that are with neural networks that are certifiably stable. Um, stability, of course, was a big point of emphasis in a lot of the talks. I think we'll be in the later talks as well. Um, and there is this sort of conflicting thing. I mean, you can, of course, yes, you can, of course, you know, make your system, uh, make your system projected to be stable with some convex problem at each point, but that's sort of somehow unsatisfying. It doesn't feel like a real neural network. And so um, the last thing I'll say is that there's also work, some work we've, we've done to um, enforce stability of dynamical systems when you are learning them with neural networks. So the idea here is that we want to learn some continuous time dynamical system. Uh, and it, for now, it'll be an autonomous system, so there's no control. Actually, incorporating control is not that easy here. It's easy if you do it sort of trivially, but I think someone was actually even talking to me about this this morning. Uh, I'm not sure they are, but uh, it's actually not this. this, this so so I, I don't want to make it sound like the, like the extension here is simple. Like it actually is not simple uh, if you're doing it in a meaningful way. But if you have an autonomous system, um, the question is, how can we learn the system as a neural network in a way that's guaranteed to be stable? So every, you know, exponentially stable to, 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 to zero, say, or to any other point that you want. Um, and and you know, this is a hard problem, or it seems to be a hard problem, right? Because this, this is actually not even that easy, even for linear systems. This is still not a convex problem, right? You have to alternate between finding the Lyapunov function um, and then you know, optimizing your, your, your dynamics. And so the key aspect that we sort of exploit here is that if we're learning the function, we can define, again, this notion of we can define our function to be whatever we want. Right? And so we can actually in, uh, just design our function in a way that guarantees this stability everywhere. And the key sort of idea of our approach to this and several other competing approaches kind of came out in, in later years or simultaneously uh, familiar with things like Hamiltonian neural networks. That was a, a came, came, came along the next year, I think. But the basic idea is that we know from the Apinov theory that that this system is stable um, if there is this Apinov function that proves its stability, right? So you know the inner product of this of this uh, of the derivative of the Apinov function and our and our and our dynamics here uh, is less than some multiple of the Apinov function. That's a, it's a condition for for um, exponential stability. And so the key idea here is, again, kind of like we did before with the guaranteed control laws that could satisfy robust control, is that we define our network as the projection of some nominal dynamics onto a Lyapunov decrease set, okay? So we actually parameterize both our function, our Lyapunov function V and our nominal dynamics G, as neural networks, little v has some conditions there. You have to make it convex and things like that, but we can do that uh, with some tricks. And you define your final dynamics to just be the projection of our normal dynamics onto the set of all points that decrease this Lyapunov function sufficiently. Right? And it turns out this actually has a very simple closed form solution. Um, conveniently expressible as actually a ReLU operator. Um, so we can even can do it really efficiently in existing, uh, existing networks. And, and we can basically guarantee um, under certain conditions, if we parameterize our functions correctly, that uh, this is guaranteed to be stable. And we see sort of, you know, this, this can kind of see this very nicely that we start out with, with some nominal dynamics G here, um, some randomly initialized Lyapunov function B, um, 
These functions are parameterized in such, in such a way that this function is always convex, but their combination leads to a function that no matter what weights are chosen for the network, this function will always be, can be quite complex, but will always be stable to the origin. And this is very nice for learning things like um, dynamical systems. So if you want to learn something like a pendulum, you can actually just use this kind of function, this f here. This is a differentiable function now. I can just treat it as a neural network and fit it to PyTorch data, fit it to data using PyTorch like anything else. Um, and it fits the data well while simultaneously being stable. And so even for like eight link pendulums, which are hard to predict except for a very short period of time because they're chaotic systems, um, we still have data, of course, which is, which is um, you know, over time, it does not blow up like a normal neural network would and go unstable. It actually rightly assumes that, you know, a damped pendulum will always settle to the zero position. What's very cool, though, is we can also do this with higher dimensional systems. So we also have this with um, uh, using these sorts of stability guarantees to learn what are called visual textures. They're basically little, little video snippets that are guaranteed to sort of move around arbitrarily and never, never diverge too much. What we did here was they actually use uh, what's called a variational autoencoder. It's sort of a way of encoding images to a, a latent dimension. We use a dynamical system over this latent dimension then to model kind of the dynamics of like how human you know, like fire evolves over time. And then we parameterize the function this way such that it's guaranteed to be a stable system. Uh, here we also are adding noise, so it's guaranteed to be a, you know, not just stable to the origin, but it's an oscillating system and kind of go from there. Okay, so that's actually all I'm going to say, but let me, let me end with some final thoughts here. I, I still am of my time talking only 40 minutes. <laughs> okay, so the, as a final thought, deep networks are typically seen kind of as black boxes. Right, where we have some very powerful function approximator, but they're thought of as a black box where we can make very few guarantees about the nature or quality of the predictions that, that black box makes. And I think, you know, without too much exaggeration, at least maybe up until five, 10 years ago, this is how I think most people thought about neural networks. The point that I want to make, though, is that neural networks do not have to be matrix multiply, ReLU, another matrix multiply, another ReLU, right? That's not what a neural network is, at least in the age of automatic differentiation libraries like PyTorch and TensorFlow and, and, and JAX. What a neural network really is, I think, and again, great marketing term, neural network, right? What a cool, what a cool term. <laughs> um, what they really are is that they are differentiable composable functions that you can train in an end-to-end -end fashion. And with that mindset, we can embed really whatever structure we want to in those functions themselves. And so honestly, the, 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 the line here between system identification and, and neural network fitting, it really is blurry at this point. I mean, sort of almost just depends, like are, are there a couple sigmoids or values in there somewhere that's in neural network? If there aren't, then it's just this ID, right? This kind of stuff. So what I would argue is, we can think very heavily about neural networks as structured, differentiable, composable functions, optimize them that way, and in doing so, actually embed much of the guarantees we want to have about these things directly in the networks themselves. All right, well, thanks very much. Um, a lot of this is on our on my, on my, web, my, my website, of course, and happy to take maybe a few questions now. Very nice talk. Uh, we're over time, <laughs> but maybe a quick question from the audience or the online audience. Well, maybe just a quick one, the role of feedback. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, I mean, to be clear, like in it's different for different things. But again, like the overall high level thing here is that is that uh, yes, of course, when there's feedback control, you can implement feedback control in many of these things. So, so this whole section here on on differentiable, on, on you know, uh, satisfying robust control constraints within deep networks, this is all based upon feedback control, right? So this is all, these are feedback controllers where you're, you're right. What I mean is uh, what is the rough feedback loop around the neural network? I see, so, 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 so what about the, the learning dynamics of the network itself, you mean? Yeah. yeah. 
So the learning dynamics of the network itself are as exactly as understood as learning dynamics of networks in general, but it's fair to say they're not understood at all. Um, and I don't think they actually are understood. I mean, I, I, so, so, so as much as, <laughs> even when we try to understand these well, I think there actually are big problems in, under, in our understanding of, of neural network learning period. Um, we have some papers, which we didn't talk about at all today, talking about the sort of the, 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 the nature of sharpness and smoothness of the lost landscape of normal, just simple neural network optimization, which behaves very differently from traditional optimization. Um, and so I, I actually would, would, would be of the mind that our understanding of neural network optimization is still very empirical in nature. Um, and the outer, and, and as far as the outer optimization, the optimizing these, the parameters of the network themselves, that is also completely not understood here as an empirical, largely an empirical phenomenon.